Okay, we're holding on in your book on page 51. Page 51. It's a beautiful sikh. It's a very nice sikh. It's not a uh, complicated issue. It's a very nice issue. And that's the beautiful teaching of the Rebbe on the concept of gratitude. And um, as you're going to soon see how the Rebbe wanted the aspect of a Jew to be gratif to be have gratitude, to thank God uh, for whatever happens in life, and uh, to always to realize that uh, that we are to be we are to we are to be thankful. You know, we're called Yehudim because it comes from the word Hayda, means uh, it means uh, which means to uh, acknowledge to 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 uh, to uh, to Hayda Hayda Hashem. I acknowledge God. I praise God. I uh, I uh, realize the good that God has done. Um, in every in every kind of situation, like like I just said before, everybody has good. Depends what you want to uh, praise. You know, you want to praise the bad. You want to praise the good. Depends what you want to accentuate. What you want to uh, what you want to uh, bring out. You can bring. You, if you want to talk about bad about somebody else, you can find bad in everybody, and you you can bring out the bad of everybody. If you want to do it the other way, then you can praise everybody. Now, everything has its rules, as I said before. If a person's a uh, Torah says, when it comes to a murderer, you're not allowed to praise him because it is not, it's not the right place for it. It's not the right situation. So every person, every situation is different. But in, in general, a person should look for the good in people. Of Always judge everybody to the good. Right, but in general, in general, judge everybody to the good. That's the general rule. And there's exceptions, 100%. No argument. Okay, let's learn a law in the Torah. This is Pasha. It's a very complicated law. I don't want you to get lost in the two psukim over here. It's not to point the law, per se, to understand the law. It's a very difficult law to comprehend. And what I'm going to put in the what well, we actually read in today's chitas, it's not a very easy law to understand. You have to learn the Gemara, really. You got to go to the uh, the Talmud and uh, the Rambam. My uh will give you the details of this law because it's not a simple law. But let's let's go to the law, page fifty one, text number one. The Torah says the Torah is talking about consecrating one's land. It's, it's today's chitas, the consecration of one's land, and the Torah express self in two kinds of ways that a person can consecrate his land. Okay? That means in one way, a person that says, I am taking the land, this land that God has given me, right? Or I inherited, and or I bought. And also the difference between inherited land, bought land. It's, as I said, it's complicated law. But in general, the law is if I consecrate my land, I can redeem the land, right? I consecrated it to the temple. I gave it to the nation. I donated my house to the temple, to the synagogue, to the temple. We're talking about to the temple. I gave the land to the temple. I can, I can redeem it. I have a certain time limit. I can redeem it. Redeem the land. Mm -hmm. I come to the, I, I donated the land to the temple, and now I want to take it back. Mm -hmm. So I go to the temple. I go to the, to the treasurer of the temple. And he'll evaluate whatever the different different kinds of valuations, okay? And, and that's where it gets a little complicated. The different kind of valuations are the way to evaluate this land, and it's a total law. You don't go to the to the to the to the to the, the market's value. We're not going to the market value or what the, what this land would sell. The Torah gives a valuation, okay? And, and it's not important again these these details. Look, you look at the pasuk concerning this. Class. If a person consecrates some of his field to the inherit uh, for of their inheritance property of to God, gave it to the gave it to the to the Bet Hamikdash, the valuation shall be according to its sowings. An area that requires a chaimer is a value of barley seeds at fifty silver shekel. So if you're coming to, if I'm coming, or somebody's coming. To uh, get the land, they hear the temple, 
let's say maybe the base of made an announcement. They have all this land. They're, 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 they don't need the land. They're selling the land. Or they're, or they're selling the land. They want they want they need money to the for the for the for the base of Mita. So they're gonna sell the land. So the trader gives you a, a, a how to a how to how how the Kayan sell the land. How he, he appropriated the land. And it's 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 basically 50 shekel to a chaymer. A chaymer is a certain amount, and a certain acre of land was, was given 50 shekel. If you had 20 acres, so that you evaluate 50 shekel per acre. That, whatever. That's the way you evaluate the land. And in the year of Jubilee, it goes back to the Kohen, etc. It's a very complicated law. You need to go to the law. Not over here. This is going to be too... That is not a, uh, this is not the part of the class. That's one way of consecrating your land. Then there's an interesting verse. In Leviticus, it continues in your text number 51. Okay? It says, and this is a couple of verses after the previous verse. It says an interesting expression to, to the verse. Ach kol chedem. However, anything that a person declares chedem, to God, mikol hashelai, from anything of his property, whether it's a person, whether it's an animal, whether it's a field, shall not be sold. If a person says something is chedem, and we'll soon see what that means. It's an interesting word. Chedem. Have you ever heard the word chedem? La hachlim, right? Put him in a chedem. So chedem is usually what we know as a negative word. Chedem means to be dis 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 communicated, excommunication. So if somebody excommunicates his land, I don't know the right word in English. Or part shall not be sold, nor shall redeem for all chedem is holy of holies to God. That's the law. That's that's the pasuk. So the pasuk says, I can either say I'm going to give this to the temple as a donation. If I say Chelam Hashem, I don't want this land. Give it away. Leave me alone. I I I, I, this, I don't need this. I'd rather give it to the temple than keep this. That's Chelam. That's the law over here. That's a, that's why it's a hard word. That's Chelam. Chelam means I throw you out. I threw the land out. Okay. Yeah, right. To put him aside him. That it, it, again, it's an interesting word. The Torah could have used other words over here. The Torah uses the word chedim. So where do we find the word chedim in other places? Look in text number three in, in pasuk. This is another way of the, using the word chedim. So the Torah says, "Psile yehele burn, burn the statues." Of their idols in fire. The Torah is talking about when you come to the when you come to the land of Israel, you have to take all pagan statues. You got to destroy them. Do not convert to go silver and gold upon them, and take it for yourself. Not only you to destroy them, but even if they had gold and silver, they were made out of gold and silver. You can't just take the gold and silver and use it. You have to destroy it. At least you stumble because of it, for it's an abomination before your God. And the title continues, verse 26. Do not bring abomination to your house. It should be kamayu. It should become chedem like it. It should become like the idol, which is chedem. Shall be utterly revile. Shak it, revile, it's a abhor. I mean, the Nessie should abhor it. Why? Because it's Chedem. So, in essence, Chedem means something that is despicable. That's what Chedem is. Chedem is something that I think is despicable. I think this ta a table is despicable. I call it Chedem. That's what, again, I don't know what the word Chedem means exactly. So, the Dovah Kimchi, the Adak, says, 
Anything that a person declares chedem to God, even though the item itself is not destroyed, vis-a-vis the owner, the owner, it, it, it as if it's destroyed. So in essence, what's a chedem? Not that the, the land is chedem. To the person it's chedem. Right? Ko chedem Hashem. The Pasuk says anything that is chedem belongs to God. So to, it means that, that why is it chedem? Not that, that, that it's chedem, that the thing is chedem. That the thing is despicable. The thing is not, it might not be despicable. But it's despicable to the person. So to the person, it's like it's destroyed. So now you understand why, why the Torah says, if something is despicable to, to me, and I say, I don't want this. So now, it's like it's not yours anymore. It doesn't belong to you anymore. You basically disavowed yourself. You basically walked away from the thing. So it's a difference between I consecrate something or I even sell something where I can always redeem it in a certain time period. But when it comes to I say something is a cheder, I don't want it. To me, it's like gone. To me, it's such an ugly thing that I don't want anything from it. Then it doesn't belong to me. For no longer benefit from it. Therefore, the Torah says, if something is chedim to you, it doesn't. That's right. So it becomes out of your possession forever. You can't redeem it. You can't come back, come back and, and say, I want it. So look at what it's different for different people, whatever you think. Whatever I especially I say. Does it belong to anybody? Right. It belongs to God. It goes to the base of Mikdash. Comes part of the base of Mikdash property. Comes part of the, 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 the temple's property. <laughs> so look how the Chinuch explains this concept, text number five. As long as the Jewish people are devoted to God's Torah mitzvahs, only good will come to them and will be supported by an abundance of blessings and generous and pure spirits. The opposite, curses and destruction will befall their enemies. Therefore, if somebody is in a fit of melancholy, melancholy, utters an expression of curses or chedim about their money, or the land, which are really blessed, the Torah informs us that one cannot really remove an item from the domain of blessing to another, cursed domain. It belongs to God. It might be cursed to you, but it's not cursed to God. Right? That's what it says. Kol chedem. What does the verse say? Kol chedem lahavaya. Anything that you call cursed is to God. For everything that belongs to a Jew is really belongs to God, who is blessed. Nevertheless, because we now know that this person really wants to remove this item from their possession, we'll give them what they wish for. And return the item to its true owner. Who's the true owner? God. And they'll become truly holy. And then they'll become holy. Anything that you throw out is holy to God. If you can Could you give an example, God, Rabbi? I, I'm not catching all this. Could see, you give we'll an see. example? You'll soon see. So if you cannot see the good in it, God sees the good in it. Yeah, I can give you a million examples. So anything that I say is disgusting might be disgusting to me. But it's not disgusting to the Abish. Well, it's not disgusting to God. Garbage is, uh... My garbage is somebody else's uh, gold. Uh... So that's the way... That's we, 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 let's, let's continue a little bit more and then we'll maybe answer your question. So look how he elaborates this, the, the next thing. It's beautiful to, to comprehend this, because really, 
the lesson to this is truly a beautiful lesson. So look how Rabbi Yisrael Gutman, he tries to elaborate on it. In my humble opinion, the concept of chedem is as follows. In truth, one who declares their property, chedem, when talking about property, any possession that he has, completes a chedem, does not intend to donate it to the priest nor to the temple treasure. Rather, he simply declared chedem cursed. If he wanted to give it to the Beis Amikdash, he would donate it to the Beis Amikdash. The Beis Amikdash, you don't have to donate the Beis Amikdash only things that you like. You might donate the Beis Amikdash like you have today. You use car, give it to the temple. You think that the temple would like to have a new car better? <laughs> but you can give a used car. So it's, I know the person, the Jew that's saying this thing is chayim, he doesn't want to give it to the Beis Amikdash. He really is saying it, throw it out of the garbage. It's a chayim. It's a disgusting thing. Why would I? Why would I donate a disgusting thing to the temple? Rather, they simply the curious chayim cursed. All the pursuant laws of chayim are only when to fix the curse. That's the point. Not that I'm donating something. I'm saying, oh, to the temple. I'm sorry. I'm donating you a cheap car. That's all I have. Is a, is a shmata. All I can give you is 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 this is this is this is this the lapi jalapi. That's all I got. No, here it says it's cursed. This is a disgrace. I wouldn't want to give it to the temple. Rabbi, nothing is cursed, <laughs> right? So the pasuk says, "Kor chayim laavaya." Nothing is cursed. Everything, if you're gonna call it cursed, the Abishta will show you. David knows what, what the value of everything. Yeah. A car is a material thing, but this doesn't just things. no. Yeah, land he didn't is... know that he needed land. We're talking about we're talking about material things. Well, I... the plastic is talking about material things. The plastic is not talking about spiritual things. No, I'm not spiritual, but animals, land, animals. Call. They... animals. The to... look at the verse. Anything. The, Anything? Is talking okay. about, the verse is talking about material things. The verse is talking about material things, not talking about spiritual things. How can I donate? No, no, not spiritual. But a per what about a person? You know, sometimes in person, anger. It says. Even a, is a material a thing? Yeah. Verse, text number two. Anything that a person declares hate him to God for any of his or her property, whether a person or an animal, or a part of his inherited fields, shall not be sold. Look at the, anything. Okay. So everything, everything. For surely a person, class for shalom. But a person should say, I'm chedim, I have no value. I'm a worthless person. Okay. Yeah, but don't they put people in cherim, and how is that related to this? No, that's a different concept. Different concept. Indeed, the Mishnah, that's not the Pasuk over here. Indeed, the Mishnah does not say the owner gives it to the Kayan. Rather, it says the property is given to, is given to the Kayan. This guy, he's, he's, the owner doesn't want to give it to the Kayan. Why would the owner want to give to the Kayan something that is worthless to him? Rather, it says it's given to the Kayan. How is it given to the Kayan? The gives it to the Kayan. Yankel threw out something. He said, it's worthless for me. So God says, give it to the Kayan. Not because I want the Kayin to have garbage, because it's Chayin Hashem, because it's worth to God. Implying that it was not the owner's intention, but rather the trader's way of handling Chayin. It does not say that the field is given to the Kayin like a truma, implying that it was given to the Kayin like other rites of priesthood. Rather, giving it to the Kayin simply. Is a simple is simply the protocol for Khaidam fields. The Sefer Khinach writes explicitly, as we said, that Khaidim is a curse the owner pronounces on their property. Therefore, it becomes forbidden for the owner to derive any benefit. If you can call something cursed, then you have given up your rights to it. 
not only the rights that it belongs to you, rights of any benefit from it. You can't even give it to the Kayim anymore. You can't even get the even get the, 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 the enjoyment of giving it to the Kohen. It's not yours. You have you have you have you have disvowed yourself in it. You have cursed it. You have said this is this is nothing, no value to you. David says, fine. Nothing. Don't have anything to do with it. Fine. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm giving it to the Kayan. The Kayan represents me. I'm giving it to him. Not because you gave it to him, I'm giving it to him. It becomes back to mine, right? You gave it back to me. I'm giving it to the Kayan. Sometimes they used to do on people. And they That's a separate issue. That's a different concept. Very terrible yeah, yeah. Therefore, it becomes forbidden for the owner to derive benefit from it. We obey the owner's wishes. We say, the Abish says, fine. For you, it's cursed. Fine. But we, we, God says, I fix the curse by giving it to the Kayin. I don't think it's cursed. I think it's it's okay. I think it's blessed. Therefore, once the Chaydim fields of a Kayin is in the Kayin's possession, it becomes permitted for anyone, even for the original owner, to benefit from it. Now it becomes the Kayin. Now it, actually the law ultimately is that once it comes to Kayin's possession, it never goes back to the Jew. But the Jew can have the Jew can have part of it. He can have fruits from it. He can enjoy it. The client can invite him and he can enjoy the field. Even though he made a chedim because it's not his anymore. It's basically not his anymore. It's out of his possession. He threw it out of his possession. It became somebody else's possession. Which is a beautiful concept. It's a beautiful law. And it teaches us the concept Really, it truly treats us as the concept of being grateful. Let it go. No, be grateful. Let it, Give let it, it as a donation. Give it as a donation. There's nothing wrong. Let it go. Give something that's a value. It might then be value to you. It's value to somebody else. It's surely a creation by God, and there's surely a value to it. it and therefore, it teaches us what means to be grateful into everything that God has given us. Even if we, if, if we look at it as not totally a perfect product to us, we, to, to me, I cannot use this anymore. Fine. Understandable. But it's, a, it's not junk. It's not garbage. It's not chedim. It's not a curse. Give it to somebody else. Give it to the temple. Give it to a client. Give it to a friend. Give it to a poor man. And we're still talking about only material things, right? Yeah, for surely a person. Like, let's say you have struggles in life. God gave you those. We're not talking about that. We're talking about possessions. Yeah, no, we're talking about that too. We're talking about that too. To say if a person is cursed, God forbid. As you soon see a beautiful Delilah from the Rebbe. You might have struggles. True. You might have sickness. You might have issues. But to say you're cursed? Chas v'shalom. That's ingrateful. So could you just summarize this? Because I'm not we're gonna go, this. Wait, we're, gonna, we're not at the end to summarize. So let's, let us wait. I mean, to up letter, until now. I, we'll I'm see a letter from the devil. So until now we learned that uh, the Torah tells us what chedem is. And why the Torah differentiates between somebody who gives a donation to the temple and somebody that says, I don't want this, this, this product. And that ultimately that, that land is given to, to the temple anyway. There's a great difference. And there's a great difference ultimately in all aspects. Because when somebody gives a donation to the temple, ultimately, ultimately, it goes a positive or negative this. Because if you know the law, and I don't want to get involved, but if, if I donate a land to, to the temple, then after a certain amount of time, I cannot redeem the land. 
and the land will become not my land anymore. It will become a Kayan's piece of land if I, if I donated it to the temple. After the year of Jubilee, it's going to return to the Kayan. It won't return back to me. And I can't have any pleasure from this land anymore. But if I give a chedim, if I throw out the piece of land and say, I'm not interested in this piece of land, then it becomes part of the Koyans right now. And right now I can have pleasure from the land in, the, in essence. Right now I can, the, the, I, can, I can have from the land because it becomes somebody else's land at this present moment. Look at the, the, the Rebbe brings down a very famous story of, Yich, of uh, King Chizkiyo. And we should realize the importance of being grateful. King Chizkiyo, he lived before the destruction of the first temple. So I'm not exactly BCE. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of struggles. In those days, it was Sancherev, the Syrian king, who ultimately took over. The Gemara says that the Ebishter wanted to make Cheskyo Mashiach. He was at that preface. He was at that situation. He also that the Cheskyo would be the Messiah and end the whole situation. And if he wasn't, but he blew it. If he was, he, he blew it. This great king blew it. And even though he had an unbelievable situation that the Gemara, the Talmud says what he accomplished, and you can look it up in the Gemara, and you can look it up in, in, the, in the prophets, talks about the greatness of this king, Cheskyo, what he accomplished. He ultimately blew And What did he blow it? What did he blow it by? So the Gemara says as follows. There's a Gemara in Sanhedrin, text number seven. The Gemara says as follows, based on a verse. So this verse is brought on in, Z- in Isaiah. It says, the Sivram Hamishta will shalom and kates. Now, if you look at the Hebrew, you'd see the verse, the Sivram. You, you look at the Hebrew, you know Hebrew. You look at the Hebrew words, you, it's something peculiar in that letters. Hello, you're teaching Aleph base. The second letter. The Sarvam. The letter is written with a final mem. Yeah. You yeah. <laughs> the letter is written with a final mem. If you look in your in your in your in your book, text number seven. So the second letter is a final mem. And it doesn't make sense to write a final mem in the middle of a word. So it's the same sound of the letter, it's mem. But it's a final mem. So the he who increases the marbe, God's authority, and for he that sh- and for him sh- there shall be peace without end. That's the verse. Now Thompson said in Sipori, Timak mukomem shebeem to tevet pasu avleisasu. Bakaba expounded this verse as follows. Why is that very letter mem that appears in the middle of the word is an open mem, but the mem in Le Marbe is closed in that verse? Why is it? And he said as follows. The closed mem indicates that God wanted to make his kiyo Mashiach. And he sought to make Sancherev Goygumagev so was the was the king who was the, the Syrian king at that time. However, and and he, and, and he and he did and he destroyed Sanhedrin in a way, right? Because that was the whole story. However, the divine attribute of justice said to God, Master of the universe, if David, king of Israel, who recited numerous songs and praises before you, you did not make him a Shia, then Cheskio. For whom you perform all these miracles and yet did not sing any songs of gratitude before you, you were really making the Messiah. And that's why it's a fine that Mem is, is closed.
<laughs> right? The mem is closed. So something was closed. There's a final mem because the words of the to, to he who increases. He increased a lot of things, Cheskyo. He was missing one thing. Gratitude. So uh, King Cheskyo did great things. And he beat Sanskherev ultimately. The Abish destroyed Sanskherev for Chizkiyo. Not perfect. Not perfect. Great, unbelievable, but not perfect. And what is missing? What was missing? One thing. So we should realize this that one thing was missing. By this great leader, Cheskyo. I'm not starting up with Cheskyo. He's a great tzaddik on his own right. He, he was missing, in essence, the Gemara says, he was missing what's in Hebrew called Hakarat Hatov. It's hard to, it's hard to solve. I know, that's why the Gemara says. That, that, that's not me. Uh, that's why I'm saying the Gemara. I'm not judging Cheskyo. Trust me. So there's two things that is missing in in in, in a, there's two things in our Satayv and what means recognizing good there's really two things in recognizing good number one is first of all simply recognizing good that a Jew recognizes good and number two is that he recognizes God in the good it's not just recognizing oh this is a great machine this is a great day. He recognized the Abishta in the great day. Right? Because if not, it returns to, that's the Pasuk. If not, it returns to uh, who does recognize it's good. Right? If I say it's lousy, if I say this day was a lousy day, so the, the, the day with the energy of the day returns to the one who made this day. If I say this day is a great day, and it's a great day because God made this day, then I accomplish both. Then I accomplish both. I accomplish both. And where we see that, we see this concept. Where do we see Akkadah Satoiv in this concept? We see that in creation. How do we know that God wanted that in creation? Two things. First of all, we should look at the good. We should see the good in the world. In the crazy world where you live in, see the good. Number two, we should see the godliness in it. That is good because God created this goodness. Right? So we see that in creation. In the beginning, go back to Genesis 8.1. Your text number 8.1, Genesis chapter 2, verse 5. It says, Now, no tree in the field yet had yet on the earth. God created the trees on the third day. But there was no trees on the earth. Because God had not yet brought rain upon the earth. So the, the, in essence, God created the capability of trees. But there was no trees on the earth. They were like, they were underneath the ground. Why? Because it didn't rain. And there was no person to work the soil. So what is the meaning of that? God created everything in the world. It was there. Seemingly trees were there, but not there. All the vegetation, the beautiful world that we have, it was like a desert in essence. Even though the trees and the grass and everything was there already, it was under the surface, so to say. Why? Because it didn't rain, number one. And there was not human. The humans were not there yet. So that means ultimately... Even though trees, are, trees and grass were created earlier, when did the trees and grass come out? On the sixth day of creation. So Rashi says, because number one, look, text number 8b, Rashi explains the, the verse, simple Rashi, because God had not yet brought rain. Why did God not bring rain? Why couldn't he make it rain? If that was the whole thing, he could have made it rain. Because there was no person to work the soil. 
What does that mean? And no one to recognize the benefits from rain. The Evishter needed a human being to say, wow, how beautiful rain is. Why? Because look at this beautiful world that rain does. Look at these beautiful trees. Look at beautiful grass. Look at this beautiful world. But when the human came and understood that rain was essential to the world and he prayed for it and it fell and the trees and the herd sprouted. So that's how Rashi learns the beginning of the book of Genesis. That the Abishta was waiting for the beauty of this world that a person should come and say how beautiful it is. How gorgeous this world is that we need rain. Give us rain. Make this world beautiful. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. And there's many answers to that question. It's a very good question. And the answer is because the question. Because how did how did Adam know that? How did Adam know? He came into the world. How did he know that there was supposed to be trees? How did he know that there was supposed to be? So Adam Rishon, Adam was Adam Achava were not simple people. They were very very spiritual. Intellectual people, they understood how things worked. They understood even like going to God. They understood how, how how the world works. But they were born that way, not by us. We are, they were born with great knowledge. Oh, professors, Professor Al. Look at the next medrash, powerful medrash. Wow, what? What? I'm sorry. It's, it's... No, no, ask the question. What's your problem? Okay, that. Then... Adam had an enlightenment that he knew. Yeah, yeah. But then when Eve took the forbidden fruit, she was supposed to be totally uh, enlightened and, and the eyes opened. It's a different kind of enlightenment. It's a different kind of concepts. Adam called all the animals by its name. How did he know? He understood the DNA of animals. He understood the essence of animals. That's how he gave animals all their names. The situation of the, the tree of knowledge is, is, is a concept of bringing sin into their existence. That's, they also understood that. There's an outer concept, there's an inner concept. They brought it into the inner. That was their choice. That was their first choice. There was no difference between good and evil. There was a great difference. There was actually a great separation between good and evil. They brought it together. Adam and Eve wanted to bring good and evil together. It should be a mixture of good and evil. That means and ultimately that we live in a world that everything good has within it evil. <laughs> everything evil, thank God, has something good. And that's, the, that's, that's really the story. But it's a concept of free choice. Correct. So that was their choice. That was their choice to bring free choice into the, into the existence. You understand? So they didn't do, they did, they did a, a terrible sin. They did a terrible sin. It was affecting humanity. But ultimately, they did it. They did an ultimate act of of what changed humanity, understand, in a positive way, in a in a in a way. That's why they were not punished. They, God says you're gonna bring, you're gonna die. They didn't die for another nine hundred and thirty years. Right, because they now you're into the world. You wanted a world. The Irish to wanted a world where there be Gan Eden in this world. There'll be separate. You'll have like two different worlds. But they wanted the intermingling of the worlds. So they wanted the concept of, uh, so God said, okay, go out of the world. You have to go to the world where you're going to have to bring light into the world. You're going to have to bring good into it. I wanted you to live in a good world and separate from the world that, that would be separate from the opposite of good. Now you want a world that needs to be good and evil. And that's why we live in a world of good and evil. And ultimately, we live in times where good, we think good as evil and evil as good. And and we struggle with that. What is good and what's evil? But that's a different subject. But 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 everything. It's not. It's not. A, it's not. A, it's not a contradiction. It actually fits in very very clear exactly what they wanted to accomplish. Correct. We are because by God it's perfect. By God it's perfect. By God there's no such thing as imperfect. That's the beauty of this class. 
But God is no imperfect. Even the imperfect is perfect. So, By human being, he struggles with imperfection. And therefore, as the Rebbe is going to soon say, you need to accentuate the perfection. You cannot keep on talking about the imperfection. Because trust me, the more you're going to talk about imperfection, the more it's going to become imperfect. You got to stop talking about imperfections. That is, that is the lesson of this class. You'll soon see a letter from the Rebbe. You got to stop saying things are cursed. Got to stop it. Even if they are in your eyes. Stop it. Give it to the base of English. Give it to somebody else. Fine. It's not a problem donating things that you don't like. But to curse things, that is a terminology that's not correct. That's where you're separating yourself from God. So that's where the Pasuk says, it's beautiful third type, and that's where the Pasuk says, to you it's nothing, it belongs to God. To God it's everything. Don't do that. Don't curse something. Because then you're separating between yourself and God. So to you it's a chedim, it's a disgusting thing, to God it's a beautiful thing. Donate it. Maybe one day you'll realize that it was a good thing and you'll come and redeem it. <laughs> yeah, you could in certain times. You could. Yes, you could. There are certain time value. You can redeem it. One quick question. Yes. Why would you redeem something that you cast? Because again, I suddenly gave a donation. Then I realized it's, I, I, you know what? I would like to have the piece of land. I had another epiphany. I realized that usually when you don't have something, that's when you realize how important it is. So it, that's correct till it's gone. So I, I donated this piece of land. I thought it had no value. And then I suddenly see this land is flourishing. It's not bad. You know what? The Abish says you can redeem it. There is, a, there is a certain time value. You can redeem it. If you don't redeem it, you'll ultimately lose it. But if you, you have a time, redeem it. Redeem the land. Right? But you at least you did not curse it. You probably gave most people give a donation. Some people give a donation because they want to give a donation. They want to give good land to the some people because they don't want the land, whatever. <laughs> like uh like you like the like they advertise, renew like re, donate your 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 used car, right? Uh, instead of getting a thousand dollars, they get they go give it to give it to a synagogue that can sell it for more, maybe. So Get your, you get your receipt and let the synagogue have the money. So, but you, you wouldn't donate it if it was a new car. <laughs> like I said, nobody's donating new cars. But that's not bad. Thank God. You, 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 you use it. You see, you, you don't have a, it doesn't look to you like so like, it's important. The new one would, would be better. So give it to the donation. To junk it, why would you junk it? So it's important, as the Rebbe is going to tell you, it's important, the Pasuk wants to tell you, don't disgrace something. Don't write it off. Everything has value. Everything has value. And the more you, 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 you talk about its value, then it's disgrace. Maybe, you, maybe, maybe you'll never disgrace something. Maybe you'll never. Uh... Right. Okay, yeah, I understand. No, that's not good either. That's not healthy either. Okay, look at the Rebbe. Look, um, let's switch to the Medrash. Then we'll read a letter from the Rebbe. It's a beautiful letter. So the Rebbe, so first of the Medrash said, look at the powerful statement of the Medrash. Why does the Torah punish and integrate so excessively? Because an ingrate is like a heresy. A heretic is also essentially ungrateful. Let's read this letter of the Rebbe. I want you to read this letter. It's a beautiful letter. Powerful letter. By the grace of God, fourth of Shat, 5,716. It's a long time ago, this letter. What? what? Before I was born. This is 19, 1960. No, 1915. 19... 19, no, 1950, 55, 56. Never writes, greetings and blessings. Doesn't tell you the name over here, self In response to your letter, in the month of Kissing, Kissing, you need to write about your current situation and how your entire life you have never experienced anything good. 
And then you ask for a blessing for your wife and children. Apparently, you don't notice the contradiction in your own letter. For someone who is created, for someone who the creator of the world arranged a match and a blessing them with children. May they live a long life and many years to say that you never experienced anything good in life. Is ingratitude to a shocking degree. There are hundreds of thousands of people who would pray every day for the blessing with children, who would give away everything their own for a single son or daughter, and still have not merited to receive this blessing. May God answer their prayer soon. And you, who did not, who did receive this blessing, apparently without having to pray for it excessively. Do not recognize the wealth and happiness that are in. And write in your letter what you have mentioned above. And moreover, you conclude that you don't believe that God will ever help you. For you believe it's decreed upon you to be poor and miserable your entire life. <laughs> Obviously, I don't mean that one has to be poor or unhealthy, etc., just want to draw your attention to the fact that maybe the meager income and the poor health stems from the fact that you do not recognize God's blessings. In an area, in an area even more important than perfect health and comfortable income, which is a blessing of having a son and daughter who follow the ways of God. When one doesn't recognize the blessings they already have, especially when they ignore them to the degree that they express it in the harsh expression you used in your letter, why is it so shocking that they don't receive additional blessings from above? Whoa! That's a shocking letter. Mm -hmm. I hope these few, word, few lines will suffice to open your eyes and see the situation for what it is. When you begin to serve God with true internal joy, God's blessing regarding health and income will certainly increase, as is to be understood from many sources of the Zoya, with blessings and the Rebus. So the Rebbe writes, another point, which is also not, no less important, is that which explained in the Holy Torah, which is that the number of blessings one receives is dependent to a certain degree on how the person receives them. Acting in a conscience with the recognition of God's kindness increases the flow of blessings and the capacity to receive them both near and long future. And then they look at text number 12. And this goes even more. When a Jew is careful with their speech, the Rebbe writes, when they do not allow any expression that is opposite of blessing to exit their mouths, then they experience only good and abundance. Wow. You gotta stop talking negative. You have to stop saying things are bad. Gotta stop doing that. You gotta say, say things are good. Talk about the good. Talk about the good. And, and you'll see, it will become good. You gotta stop talking negative. You're surrounding yourself with negative, and everything is negative, and everything is bad. And the Abishta hates me, and God's out to get me. So I know some people are going to say, oh, but what are those don't have enough children? There's so much other good things that the Abishta has given you. So don't pick, oh, that ever wrote this letter to the person that has children. There's so much other good things that you can, you can, you can talk about. Sure, there's bad things. God only talking good. Stop talking negative about yourself, about others, about the world, about Israel, etc. Why? 
because then you don't have a kodesh atayim. Then I don't have a kodesh atayim. I'm basically ingrateful. We see that in our davening every day. First, we praise God. We thank God for everything. And then we say to God, we need some extra. We need our help. We need our wealth. But first, we thank the Abishter. First, we thank God. Baruch Hashem, we're alive. We can walk. We can talk. We can breathe. These are unbelievable gifts that God gives each and every one of us. Baruch Hashem. And then we say, we need a help. We need some more panasa. We need some more money. But, you, but, but how do we start today? We're thanking God. We're not, we're not ungrateful. Even though we need more things, we need more health, we need more wealth, we need more happiness, but we're not ungrateful. We thank the Abishter for all the goods that he's given us. And that's the Pasuk. And that's the Pasuk. We're ungrateful, don't hate him. Given away, we're giving away our, our existence. Giving away to God. We are ungrateful. I'm ungrateful. Yeah, it's a beautiful concept. If we can, if we can live up to that concept. To not talk negative about ourselves. Not talk negative about somebody else. Not talk negative about the world. To be grateful. Why? Because Baruch Hashem. There's a lot of good that the Ebishter gave in the world. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem, I'm alive. Is that an un unbelievable gift that God gave me in the world that I'm alive? So what am I going to complain about? And if I'm truly grateful that God gave me life, so everything else is workable. If I'm not alive, then nothing is workable. Then it's over. But if I'm alive, everything else, I, we'll figure out. We'll, uh, we'll have a day to figure it out. If I didn't figure it out today, I'll figure it out tomorrow. But Baruch Hashem, I'm alive. And the importance, as the Rebbe says, is to say it in speech. Say it. That's why the next story is important. We, we learned the story many times. It's about Shem Tev. I'm sure you heard the story. The Baal Shem Tev, right? In the early years before he went public in his teachings and disciples came from far and wide to learn from him, the Baal Shem Tev traveled. One day the, the Baal Shem Tev arrived in the village. He made his way to the study hall. There in the corner he sat an ancient Torah scholar over his books wrapped in his talus and tefillin. This was a village parish. And, uh, he was like separated from everybody who led a life of holy seclusion. Sunrise to sunset, not a morsel of bread or sip of water would pass his lips. He spoke to no one and never lifted his eyes on the sacred tombs, tombs. For more than 50 years, he had kept this regimen, ultimately utterly removed from the mundane cares of material life. So why was this strange pestering him? This stranger, the Balshantim, said, how are you? Kept on nudging him. How are things? Who is acquiring? Is there enough to eat? Is everybody healthy? This ascetic made no reply, hoping the stranger, the Balshanta, would go away. But the stranger only leaned closer, and his questioning grew more intense. Impatiently, the guy waved him away, pointing to the door. Rabbi, the stranger, would now ask, why are you denying God of his livelihood. The Baal Shem to turn to him and said, why are you denying God of his livelihood? The words of the Baal Shem to hit him, right? The old man was aroused. God's livelihood? The audacity of this, un uh, this English word, peasant? What are you saying? He demanded in a thunderous word. How dare you disturb me with this such bab blasphemous babble? So only what King David, the sweet singer of Israel, proclaimed in the Psalms, replied the Baal Shem Tev. I'm not bothering you. I'm telling you what the Baal Shem, I'm telling you what King David said. Tell me, Rabbi, what is the meaning of the verse? And you, the holy one who dwells 
by the praises of Israel. We mortal things, continued Baal Shem Tov, when the parish made no reply, sub, sub, subsist on the sustenance that God provides us in his great kindness. But what does God subside in? Subsistent on, on the praises of Israel. When one Jew asks another, how are you? And his fellow responds by praising and thanking the Almighty, thank God. They are nourishing, so to say, God. Deepening his involvement in creation. That's how Kodos takes. Thank God. So when somebody asks you, how are you? You don't start telling him about all your headaches and all your foot aches and all your stomach aches. Thank God. With the headaches and with the foot aches and with the stomach aches. Thank God. Thank God. Baruch Hashem. I'm alive. I'm alive to be able to complain about the foot and the stomach and the headaches and no money, et cetera, et cetera. Thank God I'm alive. Could it be better? That's an expression by Chassidim. If good is good, is better not better? Yeah, those can be better. We can have better health. We can have better wealth. We can have more nachas. We can have a lot of better things. But thank God. Thank God that, I, that, I could, that I'm alive. That I have, I have some health. I have some capabilities still in, in, in life. What am I complaining about? And that's why, how do we start of Davini? I give thanks to God. He's good. His kindness is everlasting. As, as the song goes, you have to latch on to the infirmities and then we can have it. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. Saying. And that's what we learn. So that's an important thing. Not that we're denying that this tzaddis and this problems. How do we Jews get up every day? I say, when things are happening, we see what's happening in the world. Right? So what do we say? No. We're here. We can fight for, for, for ourselves. We can stick up for ourselves. We can do the right thing. We can fail. We can pick ourselves up. There's unbelievable kindness in the world. Is it, is, is, it, is, it, is it perfect? No. Mashiach comes, it'll be perfect. And yeah, that's the reality. Until Mashiach comes, it's not perfect. It's okay. Okay. Therefore, it's over. Therefore, it's a disaster. It's Chedel Mashem. It's, it's over. It's it. Life is over. No, life's not over. Life's not over. Baruch Hashem. The Rebbe will always say, you learn from Rabbi Akiva, who lost 24,000 students, I mentioned on Shabbos. What did he do? He started again. That's it. You start again. You're alive. You're alive. You start again. And he did start again. And he started with five students. Rebuilt the whole situation again. Was he sad? I'm sure he was extremely sad. Who, who wouldn't be sad if a plague in, in, in less than a couple of weeks uh, brings about the passing of 24,000 people? That must have been a tragic situation. Not only for him as, the, as their teacher, but Masabi to the Jewish people that were in, in, in the land of Israel. Masabi was the greatest tragedy that happened in, 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 a, in a very short period of time. But it brought an end to Yiddish guy. It brought an end to life. It brought an end to existence. No. We're sad, but we thank God we're alive. Even in the deepest moment, there's always a form of... Uh... There's, a, there's a lot to be thankful for. There's a lot to be thankful for. No, I'm serious. It's true. You know, we want to compare October 7th to the Holocaust. The Holocaust, the Jews had no power. They had no power. Maybe the... God, if it wasn't for God, Hasid Shalom, I mean, the, 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 the Jewish people would have been wiped off the map. Because they were, they were powerless. Baruch Hashem today. David gave us a, a land. He gave us a God. He gave us, a, gave us an army. He gave us power. We can fight for ourselves. It's not, it's not 1940. 
Then they killed six million, and we killed nobody. Killed a couple. Today we, 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 we flattened out Gaza. So it's not not the same. But Hashem. I mean, is it, is it good? No. We need, we need this to come to, we need a victory. We need to come, just come to them. But to say, it's over. It's finished. That's it. Let's pack our, let's pack our bags. No, we have to be thankful to God. We have to be thankful to what the situation we are in, the situation we, we, we're going we, we to continue to, 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 to accomplish, and amid Shem, to bring this to, 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 to bring this situation to a positive conclusion. We have to be thankful. But at the same time, why are, all, why are there all the problems? Okay. Because Mashiach's not here. So we're going to have problems until Mashiach comes. That's it. But the world is not, the, 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 the Jewish world is not perfect, and the, the world at large is not perfect. You can see openly that the world is not perfect. If, 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 if today in the world we, we're condemning good over evil, and we think that evil is good and, 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 and good is evil, you have a big problem in the world. So the world is mixed up. And um, sad. It's really sad part of the world that the world really doesn't care about really what's good and what's evil. Isn't it and it's just a sad situation. Till today, you would think that today people in the world realize what's good and what's evil and fight for good. No. The world is not thinking about that. Right? Although whatever the reason is. Whatever the reason is. It's not important to read. The, the, my, for me, the, the outcome is important. We need to get rid of evil. The world needs to come together and get rid of evil. And that's the world doesn't want to say that. We need to get rid of evil. These kind of people need to be eradicated and need to be got rid of because they're evil. That's it. And that has to be done. Sure, we want everybody to do tshuva and everybody to repent and everybody to become good. But the point is, until then, they need to be, the evil needs to be taken out of the world. Sad thing for this situation to take evil away from the world. Especially the evil is humans. And that's a very sad situation. That humans can be so evil and you have to get rid of them. And it's sad. And who has to do that? The Jews have to do that. And the world, the Jews have to do that while the world is condemning the Jews of doing that. It's like, it's unbelievable uh, that the world has a chutzpah to condemn the Jews getting revealed when the, when the, when the world does that. And uh, uh, they do that. And they, they are allowed to get rid of evil, but Jews are not allowed to get rid of evil. Uh, but it's such a contradiction. In, in, uh, but, but you know what? We're gonna, we, we, have to, we have to not listen to the negative of the world. And we have to keep the, the message positive. And we have to keep the message on focus. And uh, just, just disconnect ourselves from the, from the negative messages of, of, of what you listen to on the radio or on TV, whatever you, wherever you listen to it. So uh, as it, let's end this off. As the Gemara ends off in text number 15, even though the wine belongs to its owner, gratitude is given to the one who pours it. So even though you say, you poured me a, bottle, a cup of wine, why should I thank you? Why, why should I thank uh, the person when I come to the person's house? It's, all the food is from God. You thank the host. You thank the, the woman of the house that made the food. <laughs> have gratitude. We need to all have gratitude in life. It's a beautiful Sikh of the Rebbe. We should all learn the concept of gratitude, not only as a concept, but start simply to thanking, start talking about the good things in life. Start talking about, think about the bad things in life and talk about the good things in life. Wow. Instead of the other way, that we always talk about the bad things in life, or things are bad, and things are bad, and things are bad, and oh, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible. Think about the bad things and start talking only about the good things in life. And have a chorus atreif. Because when you talk, that show that's the in essence, thinking about good is not the parnas of God. Saying good, that's what the Baal Shem Tov said. Thinking about good is not God's parnas, God's uh, livelihood. Saying Baruch Hashem. When somebody says to you, How are you? Baruch Hashem, thank God. That's the parnas. That is the livelihood of God. God bless you all, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you. And and uh, Mitch, we will. Uh, I'm actually be next Thursday in uh, California. See if I can do the class. If it's uh, be, uh, ten o'clock is yeah, I can do the class next Thursday. 
I'll do when it. When Shavuot will you be here on Sunday? Two weeks. Uh, Sunday, no, I'm going to be.